And so today we're turning to our series. This is part 13. We're just one more part next week, and then we're going to do Easter, and then we're going to go into another book. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Genesis chapter 22. And this is Abraham and Sarah's final exam. We have been walking with them all the way for 25, 35 years from Genesis chapter 12, where we heard and read about God's initial call and how they stepped up and stepped in. And we've been walking alongside them in their journey of faith, reflecting our own journey of faith. So what we see written in Scripture, okay, is about them, but it's also for us. And as you read Scripture, I want you to read it with open eyes, understanding what's true about God and also what we are to do. We're looking for what is true and what to do. Read Scripture that way. And so we've seen this couple make wonderful, outstanding steps of faith. And we've also seen them make some mistakes, both the good things and the promises in the form of Isaac and all of those promises. And then also some of their missteps coming to play, coming to fruition that they had to deal with. Now, as we see in this passage today, and it starts out that for some time, after a while, remember that Abraham and Sarah, remember this as we planted a seed in the ground, okay? They planted a tree with a significant symbolic thing saying, we are planting ourselves in the promises of God, which I encourage you to do the same. Instead of just tasting and see that the Lord is good, good, holding on and knowing and planting yourself in the goodness of God and his promises to his word. So that's why there was a little acorn last week, and that's why I'm asking and calling us that this is where I'm going to be as for me and my house, regardless of what happens in society, regardless of what happens in the world, we will serve the Lord. And so we are looking to be people like that. And in time, it often is a process. And we saw this in their lives. And we can see it in our lives where we have taken steps out. And all of you have taken steps out in faith. And all of us have taken steps out not in faith. And so all of these things come to fruition as God continues to mature us and conform us in the image of His Son. That's God's goal for you, by the way. To conform you, conform me, that we would look like Jesus, not a short male Jewish person, not physically, but internally, okay? morally, characteristically, that we would look like him so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So when we get to eternity, there's a family resemblance. Hey, I know you because you look just like your older brother, Jesus. Right? And so as he was formed, which is mind-blowing in of itself, we are formed. And this comes through tests, comes through trials, it comes through mountaintops, it comes through valleys, it comes through all of those things as we continue to journey forward. We have seen this in the life of this very important couple. And today we're going to look at their final exam, so to speak, on this earth. And there's three things that I want you to know today that are going to help you, encourage you, that will strengthen you, give you perspective on your own life, and in particular, those tests and what they mean. So this is the first point as we enter into Genesis chapter 22. No, God will test you. I want you to know that, and we're going to talk about this. So here we go in verse 1 of Genesis 22. Some time later, okay, connected to the previous chapter, okay, we don't know how long this time was, but there was a period in which they planted themselves and they just grew. God wasn't actively, per se, speaking to them until this So know that you hang on to the promises, what you know, stay there. Some time later, God tested 
Abraham. Some time later. By the way, tests are all over the Bible. I just did a quick study this past week and put into my concordance all the places in which tests were labeled. And I found numerous, numerous places where God tests his people. And if you have notes, I have a number of references there for you. Those notes are online, by the way, if you're looking for them. God tests his people. God also invites us to test him on his word. Jesus in the New Testament tested his disciples. The apostles tested the churches. We are told to test ourselves. We are told to test the spirits. We are told to test everything and to make sure that you hold fast and tightly to what is good. James tells us we are blessed when we remain steadfast under trials, that the one who has stood the test will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And at the end of our life, our lives will be tested through fire. So don't be surprised when there are tests. Don't be alarmed that when things happen. Life is full of tests, and it is beyond grade school and high school and college. These things continue all throughout our life, and tests are a normal part of life in relationships with others and with God. No, they are coming. No, you will face them. Don't be afraid, but be prepared. Also, I want you to know that when God tests us, He either proves us or He improves us. It's not for our destruction, but it's for our instruction when God tests us. He's not trying to destroy you. Tests are an opportunity to prove what is there. That's why your teachers gave them to you. That's why you test various things, your alarm clock and your mm, cell phone and various things. It just proves what is there. So when God tests us, he's proving us or he's improving us. This is where we can grow. This is where we can learn. This is how we can rely on him to a greater degree. I want you to know that about God. And it's not, again, tests are not for our dis destruction, but for our instruction. One of the good questions you need to ask yourself when you are facing something that is bigger than you, or difficult, or even perhaps mundane. What am I learning through this? I'll ask people that question. It seems like a rude question, but it's really not. Right? So what have you learned through this? How has God shown up to you in this where are places that you did well? Where are places that you did horrible? And how is God using this to conform you into the image of his son? We don't often ask those questions because we're so fixated on our own wounds, right? I want to encourage you to look beyond that and say, God, what are you doing? What are you saying? How am I doing? What are you doing? doing. Because God loves us, he proves us or improves us. 
And at this point, Abraham and Sarah had faced many tests. And again, sometimes they did great, and sometimes they did poorly, just like us, but continue to take steps forward. So after 25, 35 years, God met with Abraham, and we know this to test him. So we understand what is taking place in this chapter. He said to him, Genesis 22, the second half of part of verse 1, and he said to him, Abraham. He didn't say to him, hey, you over there, what's your name again? (laughs) You don't ever need to wear a name tag with God, by the way. He hasn't forgotten your name. He knows your life. You are not off of his radar. He hasn't lost anybody, including you in your life. So if you feel like God has forgotten you, that's a lie. God has not forgotten forgotten you. He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows all that is taking place internally, externally. He knows. He sees in just the right time. He works powerfully as he continues his grand plan. So he said to him, Abraham, Abraham responded, I love this response, by the way. He didn't say, where you been, yo? It's like, really, it's you again? He didn't respond that way. Why? Because he'd grown in relationship with him. What a privilege it is for God to speak to us. Come on, now hear me. What a privilege it is. And Abraham, instead of hiding like Adam, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, promise giver. Here I am. What a beautiful response, he replied. And God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love Isaac, the son of promise. Now, did he have another son? Yes. In one sense, there was a separation and there was a death, so to speak. There was one son left, the son who he dearly loved, the son of promise, the son that they've been anticipated, the son that brought laughter. He says, hey, take the son, the son that you love, go to the region of Moriah, And here is a startling ask. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. On a mountain, I will show you. Now, the first time you probably have read this, it probably shocked you. What is this? I thought God was pro-life, and this was pro-promise. And then God is asking this man to sacrifice his own son by his own hand in worship to this God who gave this son and extended this calling. What is going on here? Now, I want to have us understand this in context. Because the first time that God extended an invitation to Abraham and test him, he was asking Abraham to leave what was familiar and comfortable, right? Leave your people, leave this region, leave your father's family, asking him to leave what was comfortable in exchange for what was offered. For I will make you a blessing, and I will give you a place, and I will bless you, and all of the nations will be blessed by you. That was a particular type 
of tests. Will you believe me and leave what you know behind in the hope of and in the promise of what I am yet to give you? That is a certain test. And you and I will face that and have faced that test. Will you leave all and follow me? That was his first test. Now his final exam was a little different. This was a test that after he had received the promise, it wasn't a test to give up for something better. It's It was a test of, will you now give up this blessing because you love me? Will you sacrifice for me? It makes us question, do you love God for what he gives you? Or do you love God because of who you are? That's a massive question. And unfortunately in our country, this prosperity theology makes God into jackpot Jesus that we're looking to get from him. And if God doesn't give me health and he doesn't give me wealth and he doesn't bring all my kids back or make my hair grow back again, then I'm not going to let him anymore. Like he's beholden to us. And many, unfortunately, Western American Christians have grabbed onto that. They only follow God because of what they think they're going to get from Him. That's not the question here. Will you follow and obey God because you love Him? You honor Him? You would gladly give everything you are to Him. That's the maturity Question, not the immaturity question. I know people who have lots of influence that are famous, that have a lot of wealth, and I know a couple really wealthy people. As they grow up, they wonder why people want to hang out with them. Are they wanting to be around me because they would get something out of it? Or do they actually want to be around me because they're choosing to be around me regardless if I give them anything? God has everything. And we have to ask ourselves, why do you follow him? Are there benefits? Yes. But in following God, there comes times in which will you sacrifice me. Jesus said, if you love any other person more than him, you and I are not worthy of him. That kind of twisty, generalized image we get in American Christianity of Jesus kind of waiting around for you to kind of notice him in the corner as he kind of says, will you please like me? That's not the correct image of Christ. He says, come follow me, and he keeps moving. And he tells us, do you love your father or your mother or your grandparents or your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren or even your life more than me, if that's the case, if I'm somewhere in your priority life, well, I love my wife and Jesus is kind of somewhere, he says, you're not worthy of me. That's strong. This is the test in which he was giving to Abraham a test that was similar to a guy named Job. Have you heard of Job? You remember his test? God was <laughs> bragging to his angels, and, and Job chapter 1 talks about Satan was among them as well, Right? And he was bragging to them, and he saw Satan and said, Hey, say, Satan, have you considered my, sir, sir, whoa, my servant Job? I'm on edge here. Okay. 
And Satan was like, yeah, no. Hey, hey, God, he only serves you because you are good to him. He has all this wealth, and he has a great family, and things are going well. He only serves you because he doesn't love you because of who you are. He loves you because what you can give him. If you take away everything from him, he will curse you to your face. God says, all right, it's on. Bring it. And we read the book, and you see what happens. He was tested, like at times we are tested. Do you love God? Now check this, this is an intentional wording, because of who you are. It's a test of you, test of me. Abraham went through that test, and are you willing to follow him when all looks lost, or when it costs you something, and perhaps something you dearly Love. Are you catching me here? This is the calling of God. These are the people when the going gets tough, man, they buckle in and double down. They run into danger, not from it. They hold on tighter and pull in closer to God and says, whatever it's take, you are the pearl of great Christ, you are the treasure that is greater and more precious to me than any. This is the test Abraham faced. Will you give up what I've given to you, Abraham? What you've waited for. Do you love me more than these? Jesus to Peter. It is a significant line, a powerful test, a place of proving. And so many of us in this room have taken this very test. Though God and His goodness asks us at times to put the knife to the thing that we love best because we love Him even more. So, Abraham, after we've been walking through him and in the past where he's been scared of his own life, remember, he's failed, he failed. What will he do? Verse 2, early the next morning... Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about, similar to the first calling, but different. Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham looked up, and he saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. When times of testing come, get up, get ready, and get to it. Don't run and hide and try to weasel your way out of things. Man up, woman up. Get up. Get ready and get to it. This is what I call OTOs. These are opportunities to overcome. And this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. This was a long obedience in the same direction. Three days, Abraham. And it gives us, the text gives us great details. He got up, right? He got his donkey. He called his servants. He cut the wood. There was this preparation process that he had to think about. And then there there was an intentional walking, 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 mile after mile, three days worth of looking at his son, looking forward, looking beyond to God, and intentionally making steps in God's direction. Not just, well, I'm going to do this now, get it over with. This was an, an intentional test. 
He had time to turn around and say, yeah, I can't do this. He had time to say, mm, I don't think so. And I don't know his thoughts, but I would have been probably a mess, to be honest. But he continued steadfastly moving forward. And did you notice a little hint in what he responded? Let me point you back to verse 5. Saw the mountain getting close. Servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back. Did you catch that? Abraham, knowing and trusting God, he said, we're going to go and we are going to come back. There was a statement of faith. So what was happening there? Well, Hebrews gives us a little window into Abraham's thinking. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, describing in this faith chapter, described this incident for us. By faith, Abraham, verse 17 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Verse 19, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which Figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You see Abraham's growth here? Remember when they lied, they were scared of their death. They're going to kill me, these Egyptians, because of you. They're going to kill me, these Philistines, because of you. They're going to kill me. Now he's come to a point of planning himself and God's promises and saying, you know what, even if I'm killed, even if he's killed, God will keep his promise to us. I'm going to follow him regardless of what happens because I trust him for my past and I trust him for my presence and I trust him for the future and he is God and I give myself fully to him. Maturity of faith. These are mature people. It takes some time to walk that way. Where are you in your tests? Where are you in your maturity? Where are you in your faithful following of the faithful one? Even though he slays me, yet I will worship him. Remarkable. Second point. <laughs> I'm cramming a lot in this, but we're going to go. No God will provide for you. He will test you because of his goodness to you. But in his testing, there will be provision. Here we go, verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife and the two of them went on together Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham father yes my son the fire and the wood are here Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? The burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. Here's the truth. 
God always gives to us what he requires of us. You are not left alone to your own devices, in your own strength, in your own wisdom, in your own power. He asks us to follow him. He asks us to trust him. And he helps us in so doing. Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you. Why? How? To will, giving us the desire to follow him, and to act, giving us the power to do what he asks according to his good purpose. God works in us, and when he asks us to follow him, he gives us even the desire to follow him. And then when he asks us to do something for him, he gives us the power to act according to his will so that God will be in all and sufficient and working through all for his glory and strength. So even your desire to be following God and be in relationship to him is from him. And even your ability to do anything, to walk in his direction, is because he's empowering you. You are not left alone. You are not left to your own devices. He will never ask you to do something alone. Because he's always with you. God himself will provide the lamb. That goes and points to Christ. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there. It required some thing of him. He arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. Laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to, ha- to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Can you imagine that moment? Here he was, got it arranged. Here was his son. I don't know how Isaac responded to this. I don't know if they had conversations. I don't know, but here he was, his beloved son. I cannot imagine this. I have two daughters, and they are beloved by me. I cannot imagine this. And here he was, ready to make the blow. Just. Abraham, stop, stop, stop. Here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. You love God. You're obedient to God because you have not withheld from me, your son, the most precious thing to you, your only son. Abraham's faith and love for God was proved genuine by his actions. Did God know what was going to happen? Of course he did. Again, he wasn't like, boy, I hope this turns out. He knew what was going to happen. But God in his sovereignty, pointing to the proof that was interior, that was proved by and completed by what happened externally. Abraham's action was proof of his faith 
That is why James points to this incident in this way. James chapter 2, you see that faith was active. His faith, this is Abraham's faith, was active alongside with his works. And his faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that day. Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. If you love me, you will obey me. And he had faith and it was proven by his actions. Our actions are proof of our faith, not the basis of our faith. Hello. Okay. By grace you have been saved. Through faith. Not as works of your own. You cannot earn the righteousness of God because you're good, but you're not Jesus good. Right? Of atonement. And then we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, what he has prepared in advance for us. They're coupled together, our faith, like one wing, right? Coupled with our works like another, and now you're moving, baby. You are flying, but one, you just go around in circles, and you will go down. The other works without faith, you just go down, but together, up, up, and away. Abraham worked these things together. Verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is atonement, substitutionary atonement. One thing taking the place of another thing to pay for the consequences. Now here's a cool thing. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What mountain were they on? Moriah. Right? Go to the mountains of Moriah. There's only one other place in Scripture where this mountain range, this mountain was talked about. Second Chronicles chapter 3. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Want to know a cool thing? Abraham lived over here by Beersheba. Three days went over. He went by Jerusalem to this mountain range in which this foreshadowed the place in which God would meet his people on the mercy seat on his altar, Mount Moriah. This was also the place in which David on the threshing floor of, on Mount Moriah, said he stopped to plague the wrath of God by a sacrifice, and he said, I will not give to the Lord what count that costs me nothing. Same spot. And on this same mountain, there's a place called Golgotha. Have you heard of it? God will provide the land. This event points to Christ, the Lamb of God who is sacrificed. God who gave his one and only son, as this man Abraham gave his son that he loved. Are you seeing this? Pointing to Christ, even on that very range. Incredible. Thirdly, musicians need to come up. I'm going over time. I know we're doing communion. <laughs> Lots to talk about here. It's important. This is a super important passage. <laughs> super important. Yeah, come on up.
Third point, and I'm going to have to keep this brief. <clears throat> no God will keep his word to you. Okay? No God will keep his word to you. To you. This is the theme of this entire series. We've been in this book for months. Right? God will keep his word to you. You can't trust him. On the mountaintops, you can trust him. In the valleys, you can trust him. Everywhere in between, you can trust him. Trust his word to you. He is worthy of your praise and he is worthy of your sacrifice. He will make all things new in the end and everything you do in the name of Christ will be worth it for eternity. Pick your eyes up. Don't be focusing on the sacrifice but focus on the Son. Who is the sacrifice who gives all good things to his children? He will keep his word to you. Now look at Abraham. I'll end with this. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. Right after this is done, he provided a ram pointing to Christ. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, because of this yielding, you passed, got an A. You haven't withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, like he said in the beginning. Make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, on the sand, as on the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of your enemies. Through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And Abraham returned to his servants, just like he said, by faith. They set off together back to Beersheba. And Abraham stayed there in Beersheba. God will be faithful to you. Trust him. Trust in the lamb who was slain. He walks with you. Faith grows one step at a time. It grows by the foot. One step at a time. He is your good God. The same God that was to Isaac and Abraham and to Jacob. Same God, same spirit who calls to you. He is the way maker because he is the way. And so we are going to transition now to communion, a way of celebrating that. I know it's going over time, but it is.